So I'm Kathy Cosgrave, I'm a research fellow at um, the US and LA Health for Rural Workforce. Does that, does that sound right? Yeah, it sounds quite right. Um, and I work at the University of Melbourne, which is based in Canada and Maryland, but it has a department of rural health and the US Department of Rural Health in Canada and the same government. Um, and my role is entirely research and my expertise in the retention of rural health particularly allied health workers in the early career. Um, so just a little bit of background on the technical geography of Australia and the Australian context. So start with where I live. So I live in a town of 55,000 and it looks like this. It was an old um, still farming. It farms predominantly wheat and granola and it cropped those crops that just faded. Um, so old railway line. It's a hotel that's open a few days a week. Um, it has silos, and um, to get tourism in, those silos have recently been painted um, with murals, and there's one in the church that looks like that. And that's my house, that's a straw bale house, um, and that's my family, that's my husband, and my dogs, and that's what my daily walks look like in this one. Um, so the focus of this presentation is on the social determinants of rural health workforce retention. Uh, and I'm just going to take you through the rural context and the policy setting, uh, a little bit about the literature. Um, and I'm going to take you through two studies. One of them was my PhD study, which was on um, turnover retention, called the, uh, the main, main determinants of turnover retention and um, community mental health. Um, professionals, and they were mostly allied health and nursing workers, um, and the development of a whole person retention framework, and a current project going on in rural Victoria. Um, just so that you get an understanding of Australia, I think if you go, well, everything that's Western Australia is North Sydney. So that's what the population distribution is. And most of us live in the eastern seaboard in the last and the bottom third of the country. Um, and my research has been in these two states, um, don't know, all, all in rural and in some remote in the state. Um, so um, rural Australians, um, compared to those within our cities, generally have shorter lifespans, and that's because we have higher levels of chronic disease and injury reduced access and usage of health services and greater reliance on the public health system. Um, and uh, another reason for this um, is poor is poorer life expectancy is we have a higher proportion of indigenous people living in our rural areas and more remotely grown in more indigenous areas. Um, so and chronic rural health workforce shortages are a major contributor to Australia, rural Australians' poor health. Um, those rural health um, workforce shortages are a global issue, as we all know. And there are particular challenges for countries like Australia and Canada, given our large areas, small, broadly dispersed population, and the higher proportion of Indigenous people living in serious chronic health issues. Um, and we know from the literature that high turnover has a considerable direct and indirect cost of this, is, and I would argue for the rural communities as well. Um, so in Australia, um, we've been doing quite a lot of work around trying to address uh, rural health workers shortages, and both at the federal and state um, level, Sydney have funding um, to try and address this issue. Um, it involves a range of strategies, and, and they're most of them focused on um, educating more um, health workers, um, and so increasing the pipeline of health professionals. And they've been very focused on the medical workforce and uh, until fairly recently. Um, so they, those strategies include increasing funding at funded university places, quotas for rural for students with from rural background, and financial incentives and supports for qualified health professionals to go rural. Um, that's had some positive impacts. Um, you now can get to see a GP in rural Australia. Um, and that's a significant change. So the, the whole workforce, um, medical, nursing, and allied health has increased. 
Um, so there's been some growth, but we have severe shortages of resident allied health uh, for different reasons. Allied health is predominantly not distribution issue, and nursing is a, um, a workforce issue as uh, our baby boomer nurses retire and no one is there to replace them. Um, in allied health, which is my particular interest, uh, we have um, a, a incredible shortages of allied health senior clinicians. Um, so we need that allied health workforce, particularly through treatment illnesses. And nursing in our country is one of the main stem of rural health care provision in remote areas that are otherwise might be the overpopulation in the town and they have a very broad scope of practice. Um, so the literature tells us that there are three sort of primary um, factors that uh, influence retention. So the organisational workplace factors, what the role is like, what the team is like, um, what the organisation is like, and what the relationship with the line managers. Career building opportunities, including access to continuing professional development, which is a challenge in our, our rural areas, and social and personal factors. And they either have a pull effect or a push effect, and that can change over time. And there's an initial pull effect and have a push effect in time. Um, so, again, most of the literature has been um, on particular professional groups and in the main on medicine. Um, and it tends to focus on those first two factors the workplace, organisational, and career building. There's been very limited, limited research in the social and personal factors, um, but there's emerging research, and I'm one of those researchers, that's saying that community satisfaction is a major influence on retention in our work. Um, so this was my PhD study. Um, I'm particularly passionate about mental health services in rural and remote areas of Australia. Um, and I looked at the kids and mental health teams, there are a couple of them being funded in Australia. I wanted to know um, what were the, um, what was retention like? Um, I hoped it was going to be a good news story, and it wasn't. Um, I think of the 26 interviews I did, I was well into about 18 when the end of the study. Um, so there, um, this was a grounded theory study, um, and it was the basis of a lot of the work that I've done in terms of just using the key pointers of that study. Um, so, uh, for any of you that know grounded theory, you have to come up with a theory of um, that applies to everything you found. And I found that it was a mixture of what, what affected, um, I looked at turnover retention, which is about the best equivalent you can get for retention. Um, the professional and personal factors were key in that, and it was a constant weighing up of um, um, people's expectations, um, and there were some determinants um, that affected both professional satisfaction. Um, and personal satisfaction and today we're just mostly talking about personal satisfaction. Um, so something else we need to know that as people um, enter jobs, um, particularly in early career, um, it takes at least 12 months for them to adjust to the role. It's a little bit easier for those that are experienced. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, and not surprisingly, um, this is what happens. In the first 12 months, the focus is very much on that workplace and get, getting a hold of the job and the team and the challenges. It's a big step up to work rural, particularly if you're a new grad. Um, and there's many, many challenges there. So we're working, this program we're working with her, it's trying to put a lot of supports around that to help that step up. Um, and, um, but after the end months, uh, people spoke to me about, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, um, that it kind of flipped and uh, what made people stay or go was personal determinants. Um, uh, and interestingly, um, career and continuing access to continuing professional development um, remained constant over time. It, it, you have to be providing it in rural services to give them um, what they can get in urban or go. Everyone needs a good career. Um, so these were some of the workplace factors. I'm not going to go into them. Um, and these were some of the career building um, findings. But it's this, it's this one that I really want to talk about today. So um, what we found from the study was that non-local newcomers um, experience very significant loneliness and social isolation, isolation um, particularly if they were single. 
uh, that had little experience in rural Australia um, and they were new grads um, and sense of belonging and tech um, and integration increased over time and generally I couldn't find many differences after about three years um, that took time. Uh, leaders were generally those in early adulthood. I, um, I tend not to talk about age, but they were mostly in their early to their 20s and they were mostly in their career. Um, and they were most likely to have plans to leave and have very short stays. Um, and they, interestingly, they involved locals and non-locals. So this was to question the rural background or give you retention. Um, stayers were generally those in middle adulthood. Um, and that could run into the late twenties to fifties, and they were involved in raising families, or they were planning to make them so. Um, among those non-local stayers, they really made a conscious decision to stay, and weighed up the town and the country, um, the community's ability to meet their own needs and any significant others in the town. So it's important to think about the whole family context. Um, and public health and employment, um, when people did decide to say it was generally the employer of choice, um, very female dominated workforces in nursing and young allied health, um, and very good parental leave entitlements in uh, public health services, um, and the re remuneration is pretty good, especially for allied health. Um, so that, that was the employer of choice, they tend to stay with that. Um, so from all of that research, I developed what we call a whole person rural retention improvement framework. Um, and we're going to focus on that, you know, getting settled in and a sense of the community in place. I just must emphasize all three parts of that framework are really essential, the retention, but um, I'm talking about the social um, determinants of retention today. Um, I'm currently doing a project in Victoria. Um, so that's that right down on the eastern side. That's a pretty small state and things are a lot better in Victoria because the distances aren't really like the rest of the country. But it still has rural, it doesn't have much rural. Um, and also that one is this. I'm kind of there and over there. So there's two sites. The one on the, um, the western side is um, a small rural, uh, less than 33 beds. And the other one's a major regional hospital. Um, of a population of about 50,000. So I, I look at regional as well. And this is uh, the town out west. Um, and this is the, uh, the town that's in the northern parts of Victoria. Um, um, and so the aims were to see if we could um, develop service and context specific strategies. Everything has to be context specific for it to work. Um, there there's no generic solutions to retention. Um, at using the whole person um, approach um, to improve, see if we can improve job and personal satisfaction. Um, to reduce what I would call the turnover. Some things are not available. Um, and uh, we also wanted to check the um, my turnover retention theory um, policies outside of um, uh, the rural mental health sector. Um, I can pretty much tell you about it. I've been interviewing for 18 months now. I can absolutely tell you the I haven't found one new category. Um, so there's two, uh, two rural services. There's a participatory action research methodology, so we're really working in partnership with those health services. Um, there's a project worker in each site, and I was just fortunate enough that um, both those project workers are senior clinicians in our health who have been um, working in those services for a long time, so very good connections. Um, and I'm the researcher, and it's a um, it's a mixed method study. We're doing in-depth interviews at the start with anyone, the target staff group, and then we looked at um, the retention data. And now I'm doing ongoing surveys with the, um, the target staff on their job and personal satisfaction. Um, and there's a steering group and a working group in each summit. Um, so the, the, there's two target groups, early career allied health professionals, and in that small rural we include nurses as well. Um, and newcomer non-locals, as we call them, regardless of their career stage in our work. Um, and I've also spent quite a bit of time talking to key informants in the health services about what they thought would be as effective retention and what we needed to do. Um, so today I've um, interviewed um, more, much more than I expected. We've had very good take up of this project. Um, 56 
seven early career and leader area professionals from 33 community communities. And there were key community forums held in each um, site. I deliver um, sort of what's the role in the community um, in rural health workforce retention, but just generally professional health workforce retention. Yeah, much of the, the findings are applicable well outside of health. Um, uh, so this is kind of what it looks like after I did all those interviews. We don't, don't worry about the detail, but it just, um, yeah, uh, it, it was just a, a set of recommendations and we're particularly looking at that community and location part down the bottom. And that was the same, that community in blue was the same on both sides and nobody was doing any work in the community and location or as attachment. Um, and this is what an early career support program looks like in the small rural and um, social support is part of that that we develop. Um, and um, so just some findings about community and location. Um, strong support, social pool factors were rural background and joining partners. Rental accommodation is a big issue. There were high level of, lo of loneliness, like I found in the other study. Um, all non-local newcomers were keen to build in their social network. Um, in, China, in Victoria, because of the small nature of the state, we have this issue of um, going home most weekends. That's pretty unusual. Uh, it's probably a particularly Victorian thing. Um, local sporting activity groups um, were often described as unwelcome and clicky. Um, the towns were thought that there was nothing much to do here, but that improved over time and people generally began to, regardless of their background, appreciate and enjoy the rural lifestyle. Um, and push factors for leaving were generally life stage related, like a family life stage, um, they were either joining a partner or had settling partner. Uh, settling down friends and um, wanting to put the children, purchasing houses, etc. Um, in the small rural, this is what's happening around social connection strategies. There's a volunteer buddy program. We've established a community working group with um, what we call local government, I think it's really municipal governments, um, and Rotary and Apex, which are um, community driven um, organisations. And we're looking at establishing community welcomers and welcome dinners. Um, workplace social events have been happening, um, and particularly because of this um, tendency to go home most weekends, we're really focusing on social activities in the workplace. Um, and there's a young professional group that we started, and we this is a key strategy of ours to join with that group. I hate the name. Um, I think it's exclusive, um, but it's, it's, it's what they called in, in Australia in the town, so they to work with that. Um, and in this town, there's a homework club being established with a um, those people that are um, um, for nurses on shifts. So I'm all found focused. Um, and this is what's happening in the regional. So there's an allied health social group, much bigger staff. Um, staff is probably a couple of hundred in allied health, and the others are probably 50. Um, they, they want to lunch, walk, and talk. There's a lot of silos in um, these allied health teams, um, and they don't get to know each other. Um, and I'm just fortunate enough that the local um, municipality has um, a great careers happening here in Chief. Um, the problem, my problem predominantly because great careers haven't happened there. Um, and that's brought together lots of stakeholders. Um, and there's a working group established and we're looking at an information portal. And based on my research, uh, they want to establish a social connection strategy for the whole of um, the local government area. Um, we had an inaugural joint social event. Um, uh, the Young Professionals Group is our key strategy for, they, they run activities for uh, young um, people in young adulthood. So that's um, the, the group we're working through. We need it, it, there's any of these initiatives to be sustainable so the groups need to exist for us creating them. Um, and local government is really supportive and they're currently doing an environment plan of where are, what are, where are other non-local newcomers and how can we join them all together. Um, and they're also looking at middle adult supports, which are quite different. Um, so what's working so well is strong interest from the community groups, as I said, um, and the local councils. The project workers have really um, helped navigate the system for me. I, they're not, um, they're not, I don't live in either town, so they don't have those navigation skills. Um, there's widespread acceptance of when I speak, um, that's exactly what's happening. That's why people leave. 
um, and that, happen that happens both in the health services and the communities. Um, so there's strong participation of new staff, as I've said, there's some exemplary managers. Um, and it seems that forming, there are stronger social bonds um, in small worlds. Um, so just, I'll just finish on this one. Um, the challenges are working with middle adult health requires age-appropriate strategies and they're harder to find. Um, culturally appropriate and inclusive activities for a diverse workforce. So um, in rural Australia, there's a lot of drinking and um, a lot of those activities involve drinking um, and meat eating and that's not appropriate to some of our workforce. Um, um, it requires education and cultural change to have community driven social connection strategies, um, both in the workplace um, and in community. So we need to be patient. Um, health service managers and supervisors are generally overwhelmed and when I tell them they need to care about the social and personal, they put their head in their hands. Um, so this is why it needs to be a um, community owned solution. And there are a few examples of community engaged in the social connection strategies, and that's why I'm in Canada. Um, I'm currently um, talking to the University of British Columbia with students in work in this space. And I've recently um, received a Churchill Fellowship to come back to Canada um, to, to see if there's other examples um, that I can build on and take back to Australia. So if anyone's got any of those, we can think of good partnerships for the main places to visit. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. So we move on to um, back to Canada again uh, with uh, Rehane Lostani from Culture University. Hi. I want you all to imagine um, a moment uh, after rescheduling uh, for multiple times she uh, and traveling for a long distance she gets to uh, the nearest hospital um, and she wants to have her pelvic exam, examination with the male doctor who is uh, the only one there. You might wonder why uh, I asked you to listen to this story, which is real, a true story. Um, um, I want you to think about the factors affecting your ability um, to first of all uh, realize and define your health needs and try your turn. I'm sorry, it's just a little bit different. I'm from Iran, so some of the words pronunciation is different to the culture. Try your turn. She has his preference to um, to choose to go to see a doctor for that need and um, against all the constitutive uh, roles, gender roles that she has in the family, she finds time to go see a doctor. What are the factors affecting her ability to do that? So my name is Rutana, I'm from Iran. And uh, I'm doing my PhD studies in Carleton University. Uh, my main research interest is women's access to healthcare system. And uh, the paper that I'm presenting today is uh, a scoping review of the barriers to breast and cancer uh, in rural Canada. So I also have a background in democracy. So I want to run some numbers and stats um, uh, to show you how, why it is important to uh, um, know about cancer in general. So as you can see, nearly one in two Canadians is expected to be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime, which is a, like 50% chance, and about one in four Canadians suspected to die from cancer. More is that, um, and, uh, in 2017 in Canada, more than 200,000 cancer diagnoses and more than 80,000 deaths for cancer. Along colorectal 
breast and prostate cancers are accounted for about half of the all the cancer diagnosed in Canada in 2017. And 60% of Canadians diagnosed with cancer will survive at least five years after cancer diagnosis. So there's a chance to save them. About my topic, breast and cervical cancer, uh, why they're important? Because there are the two most frequently diagnosed cancers in women, and at the same time, they are the most preventable cancers with effective screening tests for early detection. So more stats and graphs. So you can see on the left side graph that um, twenty five percent, almost like twenty. 6,300 women were diagnosed with breast cancer in 2017, which is a huge number. And also, 5,000 women died out of breast cancer in 2017, which is about 13% of the cancer deaths in Canada, Canadian women. So, more numbers. Um, and pictures of breast cancer health. So on average, 72 Canadian women were diagnosed with breast cancer every day. And on average, 14 Canadian women died from can breast cancer every day. Cervical cancer. So an estimated of 1,550 Canadian women were diagnosed with cervical cancer in 2017, and 400 women died. So when we're talking about the screening procedures for breast cancer and cervical cancer, we're talking about like a screening means checking for the disease in a group of people who don't show any symptoms so far. And if we find breast cancer, it can be easily, not easily, it depends on the different stages it is, but it can, there's a chance to have a successful treatment for those women. So that's the physician recommendation. So women age of 40 to 49 years old should consider mammography based on the, the, their history, like the family history, if they have, if they had like the history of breast cancer in their family before, and also women, 50 to 69 years old should have breast screening and mammography every two years, and 70 and older should have it more often. For screening for cervical cancer, it's still the same. If the cervical cancer is found early in early stages, it can be treated uh, and it can be successful. So women should have um, regular pap tests. Uh, by the time that they turn 21. And they need to have a pep test every one to three years, depending on the previous test results. So we talked about cancer, we talked about breast and cervical cancer, and now we talked about women in Canada and their access to uh, those screening procedures. So a lot of the studies show that populations living in urban communities and rural areas in Canada, they have lower access to cancer screening and treatments compared to the urban regions. So, and the rates for screening for rural women in Canada are way lower than urban. So this is the study, um, like this is my study, this is the scoping review. And this is study is a comprehensive attempt to existing literature about breast and cervical cancer in screening in Canada. And this is um, to find out the main barriers that, that affect women's decision to seek those uh, in, um, procedures. So the main question for this study is what is known from the existing literature about the barriers and facilitate treatment for breast and cervical cancer screening in the USA. So what is a scoping review? Scoping reviews are, 
type of acknowledge sentences that they have, they are there to help us identify the best literature on the theme in the subject, summarize findings of the body of the knowledge, mapping the keywords, and identify the existing gaps and uh, recommendations for future research. This is kind of like our search strategy for this group in review. Um, we had uh, cancer questionnaires, we had cancer screening, we had and we added Canada literature and literature about women. So for the scope review, we had three databases now, um, which is a near sequence database, which is very good. PubMed, if you're in health sciences, this is your main source of uh, your main database. And it's good cool because um, um, this research is kind of like in sociology and health sciences, so Scopus is the best source for that. So this is our, um, like, we have different exclusion and inclusion criteria. So we started with this number of publication in the three databases, and then with the inclusion and inclusion criteria, we ended up having 11 papers ready to uh, analyze. So here's, here's just uh, like a summary of the few slides and summary of the findings we made, uh, findings of the papers uh, that we analyzed. So we ended up having content analysis on the uh, remain papers and uh, figuring out different main themes about the barriers we don't face to the uh, um, breast and cervical cancer screen in the rural area. So the nature of uh, breast and cervical cancer screening is a very, like it's a very intimate procedure and uh, uh, because of that, um, a lot of women, uh, one of the main factors that women uh, do not want to seek those um, screening help. It's the feeling of embarrassment and discomfort. So, um, of course, in rural areas, because of the um, number of um, available physicians, they, um, they have a trouble of not wanting to, to see um, the male physician who is also their neighbor. The lack of social um, distance in rural areas because the, your neighbor happens to be a physician, so you don't not comfortable talking to your uh, friend's husband about your um, problems in, in areas. And a lot of the qualitative studies, um, the first answer for those women was, I don't have time. Why women don't have time? because a lot of reasons can disaffect that because the family related priorities they have they're like yeah we have kids i have to do, i have to do that that and also when i call the clinic they always they don't give me the right appointment by the time that i feel like it's really hard. also there's a stigma we're asking why you're not going um, to have the pelvic examination or mammography, and you're healthy, you don't need it. I was married when I was 18, and I didn't need to, to be checked out. Uh, I get, like, I'm, I'm embarrassed to do that, or those kind of things. I go to see a doctor when I feel there's something wrong about my body. So those are different stigmas, like breast Cervical cancer, unfortunately, are stigmatized. So, there is the cost of different procedures, and there is the thought of there should be, they should be expensive. So I'm, I'm not affording. We don't have that much money for us to do 
unnecessary examinations. So of course, we live in China, right? And tough winters, rural areas, rural system. So if you have your screening appointment in the nearest town, close to your town, which is one hour away from your town, how come you can make it to your appointment on time when there's a snow storm? So we ended up having this um, diagram, which is the um, we have main categories, main themes, and we have different subcategories. But I explained some in the way, and these are different main like, categories and subcategories that we recognize for those who have access to uh, best and source from in the rural areas. And we also recognize different interventions that were more effective. For example, the mobile mammogram and HPV sampling program, programs, they, they were successful in increasing the prevalence of cervical and breast cancer screening because at the same time, like, they can reduce the possible cost of the screening processes. And also, the, the barriers related to the inconvenient time related barriers, like the clinic hours. And more importantly, the, the, those perceived emotions like discomfortness and um, fear of the examination and embarrassment. There are more interventions. Um, so one of the um, most important uh, factors affecting those women's ability to seek help for different screenings was they didn't have that much knowledge about like there should be some interventions uh, increasing their awareness about what is breast and cervical cancer screening. Why you should do that. Why every woman 30 to 21 should have a pap test done every one to two three years. And what are the dangers for those who don't care about mammography when they care for you. So, and also what are the ways that they can have screenings done with the lowest discomfort and um, possible negative Also, our scoping review indicated that there is a need for more in-depth quality of research and uh, maybe multi-method research for this, this subject. Thank you. On to our final presenter for this panel, Mr. Betty of the University of Saskatchewan. I'm saying national plan of Skagis again. I'm CCP and the dog is here. Um, I see, I see for me, it's even at the same thing. So I'm going to uh, be talking a little bit about uh, the indigenous uh, elderly, particularly in the north, particularly in the north, and uh, I'm going to be looking at at the, their experiences, and but not just from the side of the, um, the senior or elder. Uh, but from also the eyes of the family caregivers, because it's important to look at um, uh, care, health care, not from the only the system side, but also the um, the, um, the consumer side, if you want, or the patient or the client, whatever people call. But 
for those of us that use the health system and all of us, all of us live in a certain health system, a certain environment. So I'm going to hopefully give you a little bit of a, a snapshot of, of um, the experiences that, that uh, First Nation and Métis people and Inuit people go through when they are um, having to deal with the health system at their most vulnerable points. And uh, um, so I'm, I'm basically a little bit of a background. I'm from um, one of the communities that, I, that I'm going to be talking about, um, the Shabo Lake. Uh, it's uh, in northeastern Saskatchewan, and um, I am I teach at the Indigenous uh, Studies Department. I've been there for about ten years or so. Prior to that, I worked in in government in northern policy. I also worked in um, setting up our healthcare system in for our band in uh, northern Saskatchewan, north central and northeastern Saskatchewan, the Valentine Cree Nation. So a lot of the work, when I say about health system, I, I am involved in this setting up health services in the communities. That's kind of like my thing. And, uh, and so when you say that, you have to engage with a whole variety of healthcare providers. So you have to look at that. Healthcare providers, not only from the side of the local people address needing the kind of services that they need, but also people that are going to be providing it. So that's going to be the nurses, the doctors, and all of these support workers that that, every, that are so unique in every um, healthcare system, and not one is more important than the other. And that's, that's always been the, uh, the, the sense when we, when we work with uh, um, the local people, especially the elders, when they were directing us on how we were supposed to set up a health system and what it should look like. But, um, so I'm going to be talking about this little, little thing, just to give you a little bit of a... Um, um, uh, sort of a, a framework of how I'm going to be organizing this little talk. Um, so it basically in the north, um, and I'm talking the, the provincial north of Canada, every province has a provincial north, and, and also the north in, in, the, um, in, in the Nunavut areas, in the new territories. These are considered perhaps semi-isolated and isolated, uh, rural to be sure, but it, they're, they're quite isolated. So we have, you know, we're not, we're not just two hours away, we are four or five hours away from the nearest healthcare facility, meaning the hospital. So a lot of the development of local service and even access and, and, and the quality of the kind of services that we get, and also the impact upon family lives is, is, is very much part of that package. So in the North, there's generally, when you're looking at Indigenous seniors, uh, there is a, a you know different population data, but nationally in Canada there's uh, about six percent of the eighty-three thousand uh, seniors. So there's sixty-five plus and over uh, of total population are Indigenous people are Indigenous seniors. So six percent on national level um, of that, if you sort of break it down, uh, First Nation seniors um, consist of about five point five percent of their population. So these are the reserves. And not only just the reserves, but there's also a lot of uh, population that are off reserve, but I'm basically concerned uh, at the moment with the, uh, with the on reserve uh, services. And looking at the Métis seniors, there's uh, about, their population is about 6.6% .6 of their Métis population, about 4% of the Inuit are, are, are seniors. So in Saskatchewan, if you're looking at Northern Saskatchewan, according to the 2016 census profile, uh, and, and, and people have mentioned in their various talks, there's about you know, 37,000 plus um, people in Northern Saskatchewan. And uh, of that population, um, about 7%, 7.2% 7 are to be considered to be seniors, Indigenous seniors. So when you're looking at that, and you're looking sort of the, the population, you can sort of sense their, the social and economic demography in there. You can sort of sense that the, where the poor regions are and, and sort of where there, there's a lack of services and access to services. So uh, I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. So I am also going to be um, um, giving you some idea of the um, um, fact that the urban, the health care for Indigenous seniors, whether they're First Nation, Native, or Inuit, uh, basically, whether they're on or off reserve, or whether they are rural or urban, 
is, is getting to be a big concern for everybody. Everybody knows that in Canada, the demographics show an aging population, and there's a great deal of concern for that. And you know, in Canada, we don't even have a senior care strategy, let alone an indigenous senior care strategy. So there is there's a lot of push for, for that at the, uh, at the national level. So Northern Isiaek, you know, some people say Isiaek, you can say both ways. Isiaek means um, the elder people, the seniors. And um, so they're become especially vulnerable um, with their multiple health conditions. And, um, and most of them do have multiple health conditions. And, um, and they're generally are not well off. And uh, so, and, and we know those, most of you are healthcare uh, researchers here know that your social and economic uh, status determines your level of health and has a, is a big indicator of your health. So a lot of, a lot of that then raises a lot of issues about access then, what kind of services can be accessed locally and you try to build at that level as much as you can. So that's really the message here, trying to build as much as you can at the local level. And um, so daily life then becomes a struggle with loss of mobility and independence. And really there is a growing fear and an added stress at the end of their lives of, of who will take care of them, where will they live? And that is a big issue when you are taking, when you're vulnerable. And, and you're vulnerable as a child, you're also vulnerable as an elder. And for a lot of these indigenous seniors in the north, many of them went to residential schools. So when they get into the, the latter stages of their lives, and they end up with, uh, with, with illnesses like dementia, for instance, there's a lot of triggers back to a lot of negative uh, of traumas. And so make sure that we, we build a support system and a greater awareness and understanding of those of those, of them and, and their where their lives are at the moment, and also try to build supports around them, both in the community, in the family, and in the healthcare system. So that basically is that is the, is the message. And we know that uh, in when you're taking when and even in your own lives, if you're looking at uh, taking care of your your seniors and your loved ones, uh, uh, the older loved ones that you that you that care healthcare is really. Uh, uh, a combination of both formal care, which is your hospitals, your long-term care facilities, and so forth, but also informal care, which is your families and, and the ones that are that are the primary caregivers. So I'm not going to go into this too much, other than um, in long-term care, there's a continuum of care in Canada. It's a very fragmented health system. It's a fragmented service. Each province has their own little basket of services. Some more, some less. And, uh, and the same thing with uh, on reserves, some more, some less. So, and, and most of the reserves, what we take for granted in the cities in terms of palliative and, and, um, and, uh, and uh, sort of end of life care, uh, respite, that's not available. So when health services or nurses deliver and the healthcare workers deliver locally, it is an additional thing that they do. It's not funded usually. So we usually find ways and means to try to provide it. So continuing care is really a broad term of services, and um, and they include long-term care, they include home care services, they include various types of respite and palliative care supports. So, and, and when we talk about long-term care, we're talking facility-based care. So a lot of the push factors um, that push Indigenous elderly from their homes in their communities, whether it's northern communities or in the reserves in the northern communities, is that acute care. They, they have reached the highest levels. And so when they're assessed, they're either considered at a high level four or a level five. That means you need 24-7 care. That means it becomes medically uh, risky for them to be cared for at home. And that means you're not taking up people uh, back and forth out of ambulances every few minutes. So that, that becomes um, um, uh, a push factor out of the, out of the communities. So I've done a lot of uh, elderly care research through the years, specifically because um, there were, we were trying to find ways of providing those kinds of enhanced services in our communities. And, uh, and the thing with research is, is um, I, I, I like participatory action research, but I like action research. So I like to make sure that we provide research that does something and, uh, and enhances programs. So this little project, we, we I had already looked at the kind of services that we needed in our communities, but we now we need to look at um, from the perspective of the caregivers. 
and the project advisory group of caregivers from each of the three communities that we that we um, that we dealt with um, basically helped guide the whole process. And um, so it's a small qualitative study. And I actually initially only wanted um, at least four or five people that we could do a lot of work with, but then it, it, it kind of grew to about 14. That's just what happened. So each sort of had to be flexible things. But it, what it did give us is a little bit more of a broader scope and sort of kind of uh, different types of sort of experiences people have and, and the similarities that they have. So we, um, so we looked at the caregivers that were, had, had either taken care of their, of their elderly or else, you know, were taking care of them or were perhaps going to have to be taking care of them. So um, it asked what caregivers would like to see and also their recommendations. And uh, these are the, oh, oh. let's go back and take that picture. Give you an idea of, here we go. Of the uh, of where the communities are, and that's that's just from the aer aerial photos that, that we take. and uh, and our and our research assistants that we're doing a, a lot of the research as well that we travel to. So some of the thematic findings, I think this is where I want to basically work at. Um, we looked at barriers for caregivers. We looked at uh, uh, barriers in healthcare service delivery. Concerns about home care because these are the kind of these, this is where you, the, 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 the senior interacts with the healthcare system. Concerns about home care, concerns about hospital care, concerns about long-term care, and, and sort of their, the, the strengths of home care, what they like about these various services, and the recommendations. So some of the barriers for the um, for caregivers, um, not appropriately meeting the needs of patients, resources not available, talking to doctors about patients, and, and, and basically the, the notion of talking to doctors in an educated way. You know, when people talk to doctors, and even if you talk, if you understand English, there's a lot of medicalese, there's a lot of uh, assumptions that you as a person know about the disease and you don't. So a lot of the things that people have to find out is on their own is, is, is what is wrong, what is this thing, and where, what's normal for them today when we're dealing with dementia, for example. What's their new normal? What's, where, where are they at? And so, the, so a lot of the, the teamwork that has to happen through what's called case management in many cases, but it, it basically is a coordinated effort to, 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 to kind of herd the, the medical, the, the medical um, care providers, including the, the families around the patient. And, um, and, and so, so that they become a little bit more, um, 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 maybe know a little bit more about what, what the condition is so they can ask the proper questions. And, and so the learning curve around education is, is very limited right now. That becomes a barrier. Um, and the other one is uh, the access of facilities. There's no long-term care facilities. There's very, very, there's some that are personal care homes, but they're sort of in the, in the larger centers, larger communities in the north. Communication is a big one. Uh, so a lot of misunderstandings sometimes. Language barriers is a big one, particularly for the, for the seniors that, that do not uh, speak uh, English or not can understand it well. Uh, patients also don't get the, provide, get the services that they, they need when they need it. So a lot of the stuff with uh, home care, for instance, is 95. They don't have, um, there's, no, there's no funding for, for, for home care staff to work beyond five o'clock or in the weekends in the, in the reserves anyway. And uh, so what happens is that, you know, usually vulnerabilities enhance off their off work hours in the evenings or, or in the weekends sometimes. And, and that's where there's a lot of, uh, a lot of issues are, are, are raised. And, and so that's one of the things that's been identified time and again, and you'll read about it in the literature. Um, the other one is, uh, so, a lot of it has to do also with the um, limited home care access, which we've talked about also, that some of the attitudes of the home care workers, oh, these are young people, they need to be trained, and, and in-service training is required. And um, also concerns about the hospital care, there's a lot of them. Communication gap is, is, a, is a big one. And uh, there is also uh, feelings of racism sometimes, and also not really under, being understood or not getting their point across. 
So there's a, a lot of uh, issues on that and uh, concerns about long-term care in general. This is the facilities. We're talking about the ones um, in, in the urban centers. Um, improper care and often neglect unless a, unless a family member was around. And uh, a lot of um, people on the waiting list and not being able to address where their concerns are. So these are the strengths of home care. Home care is still probably the, the sort of the most favored one because it comes home to their home. So a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, they, they, they feel secure when, they, when there's people looking after them at home. And uh, the strength of home care is that, um, that it provides the medical care that they need and that the that they, caregiver likes it there. And when, when they are working with doctors and hospitals and, and nurses that are, that are supportive of them. And so they learn a lot. A lot of education goes on there when you're talking to uh, the medical folks. So, so the strengths of uh, long-term care Again, the, the sense of, of facility, of comfort and, and security. So these are the recommendations that came out of there. And basically dealing with training for, for the staff members, care and support for the patients, communication, improvements and oversights, increased education. And, and the, the part in there with communication goes into a little bit deeper where the elders are listened to, that there is some communication, that there is concern, that they're culturally sensitive understanding where they're from and so on. And, and when I looked at all of these, um, you know, a lot of the care and, and support that you need in the communication, when you look at it, it's really a human need. So really what you would want for your own, you know, your own parent or grandparent is really what we should be also providing for anyone, whether they're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. So in particular, um, language and communication and, and, and working with uh, some of the indigenous families and the care providers. This is all very important and it, and it really doesn't uh, take a lot, but it, but it also means that you have to be there for quite a while to help develop it. So, that's it. And with that, I have to conclude this panel with help. Thank you for engaging. Uh, audience with many questions again.